Welcome to this learn to walk tutorial or first step tutorial for working with Python. Here on hydroinformatics.com you have a couple of different options for running Python. While it would be the best option, in my personal opinion, if you install Python or a Python environment on your computer, um, as I have suggested in one of the previous tutorials following here the Python installation instructions. Anyway, for now, for now we're going to go here to the first steps with uh, Python. So that is just an introduction and an overview of the options that you will have for running Python also in your web browser. For doing that, um, there are three basic options. One is using Binder. You don't need an account for that. Um, the downside of that is you will not be able to uh, save your edits and come back later and see what you have edited. The second option is using Google Collabs where you would just clone the Jupyter Notebooks on your Google Drive and then change them or modify them on your Google Drive. That's also a valid option. Then the most robust option, in my opinion, is to just clone the repository here um, and work locally with the Jupyter Notebooks. Well, how does that look like now in practice? Let's go here to the first tutorial, which is Hello data types, meaning you're working with, uh, you're getting to know here Python data types. And what I meant before with the three options now to run Python is you can go here on the rocket button, where you find binder, callup, and live code, or you just click here. So you right click on launching binder, and this is how that will look like. Binder is cloning the Jupyter notebook repository, takes a couple of minutes to start up, and while binder is starting up, let's have I look at the second option, which is Google Collab. I'm opening that just here in the server tab so that you have the option uh, to see what it is. Um, for working with Google Collab, of course, you need a Google account, or it's very recommended to work with a Google account. Then you need probably also a GitHub account, and you can authorize it through your GitHub account. It will first throw you an error message that you cannot find the explicit Jupyter uh, notebook which is a little bit um, intention made. So you can, can get here now an overview of the uh, Jupyter Notebooks that we will work with. The very first one here for the first tutorial is PyBase. Makes sense somewhat, huh? Just click here and now it opens up here in your uh, Google Collab tab or in your Google Drive. At the same time, we had here uh, Binder running and starting. You see now here you have the same repository that we had here before in the Google Drive visible. Now here also in Binder. So you can just click here on that first Jupyter Notebook and it runs. So that's one option, that's the second option. And now the third option is to run live code. That means you will not leave the website really. But what will happen is the, the Python Windows code blocks here on the website will run automatically and build into the website. So now you will see a little bit down here, these Python windows here um, are actually executable. So you can run something. So that is just your Python command that will just bring a kind of callback, so an answer from what you're typing into your window. Um, to your uh, print screen. So if we run that, we get now here the string that we put in parentheses and in apostrophes to the screen. So if you want to change that now, that's possible now here um, in the browser. So we can here just uh, type something. This is a changed callback and it will run in your web browser. Nice, but again, you will not be able to repeat that or to save what you actually did here. Okay, those are all nice options for working with uh, Python online or um, in the web browser directly even. Um, but I said I want to go back to working locally. So for doing that, uh, let's just go quickly back here, copy the git clone link then if you have installed a git bash or if you work on linux you probably won't even need to install git bash 
um, you will find then here that console window and here you can now clone the repository to where you want. Um, it starts by default in your user folder. I will go here to a uh, subdirectory that I called Jupyter. Um, I will get and clone it just here. So that's where my Jupyter notebooks now live locally. To go there, I just uh, change direct. Or I can first look at what the name of the repository and it is well now here in the folder. See now here Jupyter Python course is in the folder here so we can just change directory to Jupyter Python course. So there we are and we can also see that then visually by running Jupyter. So for doing that we uh, can just close here the windows that we won't need so for the interruption. Um, I will just now look here for my Jupyter notebook installation. So that is all the result of installing Anaconda. Um, just as a little reminder as in the installation instructions here in the background there on the software resources. Good. So running Jupyter Lab now locally will look like that. It opens here my home directory and the home directory there is my Jupyter folder and there is the Jupyter Python course folder where I just cloned the uh, notebooks. So just click here on that and I will start the PyBase notebook. There we go. So to start your first lines of code, you have basically seen that already a couple of minutes ago. Um, you can just type here something in Jupyter Notebook as long as it is here a code window and run the code. So it's just repeat what I just did in the web browser. I click here on run and Jupyter will run here this command. So that print function is something that you will probably use um, at least once in your Python career, maybe even in your script. And it is just something that prints you a message back. So that's something where you will, um, that you have seen maybe in other programming courses with that famous hello world example, just to get some feedback from your uh, code. I just didn't want to use hello world because it's so uh, old bacon. Anyway, what we will use here is uh, Python 3. So in Python 3, this print command here is a function and that is why it is here in parentheses. And then the function here receives here our text that we wanted to print to the screen as an argument. That sounds still a little bit fuzzy for you. Don't worry, we're gonna get there and I will explain what a function is, what that is with the parentheses and also what is an argument. In these lines here, I explain you how you can also run your Python code in PyCharm, which is what I would recommend when you start really working um, with your own project, starting to develop something. But we will have a look at creating Python files locally, running Python files locally later when we're getting to the object orientation or a little bit more advanced programming sections. So for now we just want to familiarize with data types. So different data types that Python can work with. And there are multiple data types possible and we will mostly deal here at the beginning with these six data types that are text, so what we've just seen, something that you can print to the console, boolean, which means something false or true, a number, numeric, is hopefully self-explaining. Uh, and there are tuples and lists and dictionaries and sets even, and we will have a look at these now a little bit more in detail. So text in Python is understood as a string, and a string is composed by multiple characters. You can declare a text variable by putting apostrophes, so double apostrophes or uh, single apostrophes, doesn't matter. 
Um, just be consistent with your usage and do not change between double quotes or single quotes. You can also just define one character here and then Python will understand rather a character than a string. Let's have a look at how that looks like in a live code example. So let's um, start creating maybe some ice cream Python where we define here a flavor, flavor one. Let's call it the flavor one vanilla. So the question, what is that? Well, it's a string data type, of course. The first letter of vanilla is V. So let's define that here with a character. Then strings have a couple of built-in functions. So these are functions that you can just run to uh, or apply to a string. I will come back to built-in functions of particular objects or data types um, in the framework of the tutorial here and also later. Let's first run here that uh, code block and what we get here is very, the very first feedback from that print command. So defining the flavor and just defining here that first letter variable doesn't do anything that we can see. It defines in the background the flavor vari variable and the first letter variable. But to see something now in the console, we need to use the print command. For doing that here, I just used here at the very beginning uh, flavor1.upper, which means print flavor1 and all letters in capital. So it capitalized here vanilla. The second line here to print was flavor one of zero. Pay attention here, we are referring to an element of the flavor variable and Python starts counting from zero. So element number zero is V. Makes sense. Then here just another um, built-in function that is the split command. So what that here does is V, it splits vanilla at double L. And then I'd selected here the first element. So let's run that once without this first element. And we will also just comment out these first two lines here because we have uh, already seen what they do. Commenting out happens here by adding a hashtag. So these two lines are now uh, not active anymore when we run the code. And now that print command here produces us the splitted vanilla variable or flavor one variable and it room, uh, removed the double L. So what happens if we put just one L here? Big question. Exactly. It will still strip here, but there were two L's here. So it, this here is that empty. Uh, that void part here. If you put instead of the L here, the I, that's a little bit more, more unique again, we get that here. So if you put here the zero, we get the first entry here of that list. Just recall again, Python starts counting from zero. So what will happen if you put here element number one? Guess what? Correct. That's our double L. One feature of Python that can be pretty useful is that you can convert a character to a number depending on how your system is configured. So if we would use here a character of 67, that would produce us a C, at least at my character en uh, encoding of my system. You can check that here on your system. It can be possible that you return something else. This can be useful here if you want to deal with workbooks later on where you've got a color name C. Um, while I think personally that's a little bit dangerous because if you send your code to someone else who has a different character encoding, then it will not work as on, like on your computer. Um, so that's uh, more like a gadget then. You can also um, convert then a letter into an integer number here. So we have here our letter C and we use here uh, the this additional literal here and we convert that here then to an integer and that returns here the 12th. 
just take your time, play a little bit with that, um, find out what happens if you put a different character here, for example. The next data type that I was mentioning are Boolean variables. So true or false can be returned as a 1 or a 0, also understood as a 1 to 0. So in Python, you can just write here false as a Boolean variable. So if you run now that code block here, we have written here, the bowl exists and then plus string of bowl. There are a couple of things in that code block to which I want to go with you now. So first of all, with that false here, without any quotes, we define a Boolean. What happens now if I define it as a string? So I put quotes. In that case, bowl is still with and still print here as false. Doesn't change anything here. But it is a different type now. So we can check a variable's type by typing type here. Just make sure that it will also print here as a string. Now you see our variable is a string because we added the quotes here. Now let's re remove here this, uh, the, uh, the quotes, rerun the code block. Now you see again it's a Boolean type or class Boolean. Hmm? One more thing now you've seen here in that print command is I concatenated a string. So something that makes me and that enables me to use multiple variables into one in one string. And for that I'm using here that plus sign. What is important here for that plus sign is that Python can interpret, meaning to un understand all variables here as a string. So if I just type here a uh, string of bold, that will also work. We'll then just print false because that's built in in Python. Pretty smart. Um, but then there are options where it will not work. So here I'm just trying to print a boolean, but boolean is not a string, so that runs into an error. So that's where we, where we get here type error. It tells you it, I cannot concatenate a string because it is boolean. Mm. So let's convert back to a string and we can print it again to the screen. So let's look at numbers or number types that Python can understand. You have just seen above that character example where I was already using int for integer, which is pretty efficient in terms of space or workload that it takes from the computer because it doesn't use anything after a dot. So no decimals. If you need decimals, which in many mathematical operations you do, then you will work with a float. So what you've seen here just right now, a uh, bug or feature, take it as you want, is just the background here of the markdown windows. So if you double click here on the markdown windows in the Jupyter Notebook, it will show you the text, the raw text in Markdown. So if you want to see, again, the nice rendering, you just run that cell. The third numeric option here is to use complex numbers, where uh, J here is then arranged between 0 and 255. I will not dive into complex numbers here in any tutorial. I will rather stick with integer and float variables. So now to create or instantiate a number, if it's an integer or a float, we can just directly write here, for example, define a number of scoops and then define a weight that scoop might have. Huh? So the number of scoops is inherently an integer variable, so I just write 2. So that's no dot, so that makes it an integer. And as soon as I add here a dot, I will have a float. If you have been working with other programming languages, you might have heard that you need to declare the variable type before 
you assign a value to it. So in other language types you would probably need to define here scoops is an S integer, something like that. This is not necessary in Python because Python is a high-level interpreted programming language. That means you do not need to compile your Python code before you run it as already done. So Python recognizes here um, that this is an integer and this is a float. Let's go back to that print function and look at some more options that we can run. So here in that code block I put four more examples. And the first one here I'm printing here uh, an example of my ice cream exists of mm -hmm, scoops where I'm printing the number of scoops that I assigned here to the uh, to, uh, to that little string here. If I run that before I am running that code block here, I will get an error. Why? Well, my Python interpreter here doesn't know what scoops is. So we first need to run that code block. It will not do anything, but then um, it knows now the variable scoop and wait. You can see here that that code block already ran because now here you see a process number. So now we can run that code block. Let's do that and we get here the uh, number of scoops printed in that section. Then we can add here another print comment that is the weight of the ice cream. So here I'm using that float number. And what I'm doing here is actually um, referencing the number that I want to print to a string with certain characteristics. So here I told uh, Python use three digits. I can also reduce that to one digit. So now it looks like that. It rounds it. So you see here it rounds it to 0 0.5. Clever code. Or um, two digits or three digits. So if you remember the above example where I tried to print the boolean variable and that failed because I didn't put a string around it. Huh? So now you may wonder why that happened. Well, just remember here above I used a plus sign yeah? and here I'm using a percent sign. So that percent sign references here to the text. To show that example again here in the next line here I just wrote the same thing. I'm just converting here my num number directly to a string. Another option now to implement multiple variables into a print statement here is to use curly brackets. So these guys here, where I'm defining here element number zero and number one. Just recall, Python starts counting from zeros. It is a function of what I put here in that dot format uh, function, which is also a bit in function of a string. So just recall here with these uh, with these double quotes here, I'm defining a string and I can directly access here built in functions of this string by writing dot. So what I'm doing here is in the very first instance here, so my element number zero is weight times scoops. So if I have two scoops and I'm multiplying by the weight, I'm getting um, the absolute weight of my ice cream and I can tell it that it has two scoops. So what happens if I would use here zero? Correct answer, it would print two times here the weight, the absolute weight, because we two times refer here to that code. So I invite you here to hold the video and just play a little bit with this code block. Before we go on here, just recall again, if you just print here a weight with, by concatenating, concatenating these plus signs, this is doomed to fail, so this will give an error. I'm going to click on that now. I invite you to do so. The next variable type that you can find in uh, Python are lists, which are declared by these brackets. 
So just here a hint. Again, in terms of vocabulary, I'm using parentheses for these rounded things. I'm using the term bracket for these edgy things. And then before we have also seen the curly brackets. So let's define a list. Instead of using just one flavor, we can have multiple flavors. And to define these multiple flavors, we're going to do that here in a list with these uh, brackets. My first flavor here I call it chocolate. The second one is bread. And then I'm adding here my flavor one, which was vanilla correctly. So I print here vanilla, uh, or I add here vanilla to my flavors variable. Then I create here a nested list, as an example just, where I'm putting one, two, three as a first element and ABC as a second element. So nested list means a list in a list that's possible. And I'm not obliged to use then a list every time for every list element. You can also use here a zero or another capital A for uh, other list elements. So until here our code will just digest what we provided it, but it will not give us any feedback. Again, to get a feedback, we can directly print the nested list. So that's what we get here. And we can also use here just a list of strings. So we can also directly convert a string into a list. So lists are pretty useful because we can work with them. So we can increase their size, we can reduce their size. And for increasing the size of a list, we can uh, for example, use here the dot append command. So we append something, meaning we're adding something at the end. So I can add here to the flavors list another flavor called cherry. So if I do that, let's do that, and we will get our first feedback here. We get now here the list with cherry appended. Now I can also insert something here. So I can insert here the position zero. So now it will create a new element number zero, and this will then be the flavor lemon. That's here now the second feedback that we get from that code block. That's this here. Another built-in function here of lists is the underscore underscore len function. And that is what I'm using here in the third feedback line to get the number of elements here of a list. So I have five flavors in my list. And instead of just using uh, looking at the length, I can also just print all elements of the list. So for that, we will just need that our list consists of strings only, and that will then look like that here. If you just want to create a kind of dialogue and you're having your lists here, you can just print here all elements of the list also like that. So you just add a uh, refer to the number and to the elements of your list. Then you strip here with the brackets. So what that strip here means, it removes them from the outer boundaries of your string. And that is how it looks like. If you would not use it, you would again get here um, these brackets around that. And that doesn't print too beautiful, but it doesn't um, matter that much. You can also use instead of just printing in the list that dot join command that only works here that as that combination here of a string. So you would define here a apostrophe comma variable and we will then tell it here to join our list of flavors. So that here is something like a column separator. While here it is nice to have it for our dialogue, it is much more powerful if we come back later for writing output files, for example. So I invite you here to take another break, play a little bit with lists. The next list-like item that I wanted to show here at the very beginning were tuples. So what's the difference between a tuple and a list? Well, first of all, to declare a tuple, you're using parentheses, not brackets. 
and a second a tuple is immutable, while lists are mutable. What does that mean? Well, I cannot modify the size of a tuple. So if I define a tuple like that, my tuple has three elements, 0, 1, 2, and I can access these elements again here by typing them here in brackets and I get 0 or um, I can also access the last element with minus 1 instead of writing 2. So writing minus 1 or 2 is here the same thing and that also works with lists. But I cannot now use something like append something to the list and to the tuple. So I, I can append an entry to the list, I can also remove an entry from a list, but I cannot do that with a tuple. So why now would you use then a tuple at all? Well, some uh, tuples have some advantages and disadvantages. So if you are using a tuple and you want to modify your data that is in your tuple, or you want to you want to add append data to that tuple in that sense, so not just modify it, but really append data to your uh, tuple, then the tuple is probably not a very good choice. So why that? Well, it runs a lot longer. So to check that out, I'm importing here the time package. Don't care about that thing now. I will come back to importing packages or modules using it later in another tutorial. So let's just instantiate here a performance counter. We start here the time of running the code, then we define here a list, and then we assign to that list here uh, numbers from a range from um, 0 to 100,000. So I'm appending here these items to the list in a for loop. Again, you don't need to understand the for loop here for the moment. We'll come back later to that. It's just here for showing the difference between the performance of tuples and lists. So we run here through that list where we are modifying, so we are muting the list, so we're appending something to the list, and then I'm printing here the time that it took for this mutation. So let's run that code block here. Um, you see here first the tuple, then you see here the 3.03, so the minus 2 element, and then you see here my patience command, and it only reaches now, the moment that the whole code block run. Why is that? Well, that is here because of the second uh, block here that I added to mute or to modify the tuple where I need to define basically a new tuple in every iteration that I'm doing here. And that is extremely slow. So to get the same type of values arranged in a list-like element when I'm directly using list type takes about 0 0.01 seconds. Well, if I'm using here a tuple, so I'm, I'm trying to brute force mutation of a tuple with that here, it takes me uh, more than 80 times longer. Or actually 800 times. Huh? So now, why would you use a tuple then still? Well, if you just want to look at items, at data items in the tuple, then the tuple is very fast. So in that list here, we, uh, in that for loop here, we are just iterating on the tuple without doing anything to its elements. And that is much faster than iterating on a list. So if later on in your programming career, you're gonna get to the point where you have a big data set and you need to iterate on the items of the data set without modifying them, the tuple is a good choice. It's much faster than the list. If you need to change the size of that data list in any way, removing something, adding something, then the list is the better choice. However, you will always, always be able to switch your type between list and tuple, but just think about the different performances before you iterate on that. The almost last data type that I want to show we here are dictionaries and we declare dictionaries with curly brackets where the first element here is a key and the second one is a value. If you want to implement multiple elements to a list then you can do that with a comma similar to what you had in the tuple and the list and so on. So here I'm just declaring now my dictionary where I'm 
adding a value, uh, a key number one, and this is the value that I'm adding to it. So if I want to see the first entry of value key number one of my dictionary, I can just put here um, in the brackets number one to get the first or the key number one. However, if I put here zero, what will happen? Why well, it will crash? Because I didn't define a key zero. So it will know key two again because I define it here. If I'm using here the another dictionary variable and I'm trying to print here just one or two, it will cr also crash. So what I need to do here, I need to use the keys that I defined. So here I inverted the, the, the game by just adding here number two as a key. So just be aware here between the differences of keys and values. The thing that's before the column is the key, whatever it is, and what comes after that is a value. And the value can be a list to or another dictionary or tuple or whatever you want. Dictionaries also have a bunch of uh, built-in functions, so they are mutable again. So we can update our dictionary. So instead of using append like a list, we need to use update here. And then we put here in parentheses a new element for, um, for the dictionary that has a key and a value. Just pay attention, it must be here in curly brackets again, so that it can use it as a dictionary and item. So reuse and recognize as a dictionary item. And it must be embraced by parentheses again, because update is a built-in function. And every function that you call in Python has parentheses and takes an argument. So basically, this is a built-in function that takes here as an argument another dictionary and updates our existing dictionary. So if I run that here and print that now, um, so I didn't print it here, so that's why I don't see here anything. Now I see now here, added a new item. But there is something missing. Why is that missing? Well, I ran that code block already before one, once, and what I did here is I deleted an item. So I'm trying to delete the item number one um, here running it the second time uh, threw me an error. Why? Well, I removed the item number one. So let's just reinstate here my dictionary and run it again. I don't get the error because it still existed. If I try to rerun it now and I try to delete the item number one, it will crash because I already deleted it. Yeah? I also can see here then the length of the dictionary. So just give me my, number, my dictionary back. And I see here now, um, at that moment here, it still has three elements, while after deleting it, the length built-in function returns only two elements. Something very useful still is that I can use lists of the same length and um, zip them into a dictionary. That is useful here if you think about my ice cream examples from above, where I might still have weights and I want to assign a price to the weights. So I will have weights of 0 0.5, 1.0, 1.5, 2.0, kilograms, pounds, whatever you want to use. And then I'm uh, zipping that here into a dictionary. Well, if you are using kilograms, you're probably doing a way better deal. That's why I used here also kilograms and euros. So now I can print here my dictionary using the format built-in function of strings again. And I'm putting here the weight number two and the, uh, and the weight number two here of the Apple weight price dictionary. So why do I need to do that here? Well, first I'm using here the weight two. Hmm? So that refers to that element. Just recall zero is that here, one is that here, and then two is that actually third element, which I call here with number two. Now I want to get the price for that, where I could either write here just price of two, or because I zipped it here into the dictionary, I'm calling here 
the dictionary with the weight key of 2. So I'm calling here that key that has then the value 1.8 assigned to it. And that is what prints that uh, string here to the window. If that is a little bit confusing, I invite you to play a little bit with that window. Modify the weights, modify the prices, um, print the Apple pri weight price dictionary and find out how that will affect here the print statement. So before I said um, I, dictionaries are almost the last thing that I want to present you. Um, almost means because there are still sets that are also defined with curly brackets. Um, but we use them quite rarely here in the upcoming tutorials, though they can be useful if you're using um, mathematical operations such as unions, intersections, differences, symmetries, and so on. Um, and why is that? Well, they don't have that thing that you separate your keys and values with a colon, but you can uh, just use the curly brackets to define an unordered list. So if you try to call here the element zero of your ice shop uh, A and ice shop B to get some um, more or less weird uh, tastes here, um, it will fail because it doesn't know what's zero, one and so on. But you can use here operators, so that's the or operator, the and operator, or the minus sign and so on, and apply them to your sets. So these are just a bunch of examples. Um, I invite you now to just play a little bit with them, find out what's that operator before we go to that in the next uh, section. You can also uh, initialize an empty set. Um, so that here will instantiate and uh, just recall here that this here will instantiate an empty dictionary, not a set. So to initialize a set, you need to use the set function. I just mentioned operators in the context of sets. You can also use operators here to compare Boolean values, so true or false various values, where you can use the double equal sign or A is B for uh, testing if um, one Boolean equals the other one. Um, so that would also work you with that. Let's just run that little code block here. We get some little syntax warning because that is here is a little bit outdated. So we should rather write, uh, write here double equal sign. Um, and that is and then a little bit more welcome here by our Jupyter Notebook. So we can um, use here something like the not uh, operator that will also work here to get the opposite of false. Um, that might sound a little bit trivial here just in a code box, but believe me, when you're writing your code later on, you're going to appreciate the knowledge of having that test of not false or not true. That enables you to jump to another code cell or wherever you be. You are. Um, other operators here would be the end uh, operator or operator, smaller equals, uh, greater equal. So that's then not only valid now for booleans, that also works with uh, numerical variables. Um, or if you want to test here if something is in a set or also in a string, that will also work. It will also, um, you can use that in operator. So if you use your print ice in ice cream, it will return you true because ice is part of um, ice cream. But if I put here ice tea, that will return me false. Huh? So what will happen if I put here C, C, is that true? Yes, it's true because we are here. Huh? So that's it with the introduction to data types. If you have a doubt on any of the blocks here or you did not fully understand one of the data types, um, please just go back, rehearse it or come back later when you need it. Uh, otherwise, um, packages, functions, I will show you that 
later in another tutorial. Thanks for watching.